Celebrating 11 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Alan Benton. This is Anything is Possible, and my guest today is Alan Benton of Benton's Bacon. Thank you for joining us. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I want to read a quote from uh, your notes. It says right here, Then there was this time a year or so ago when he saw Table 52 restaurant in Chicago on his television screen and Michelle and Barack Obama coming out of the front door saying, uh, or I said, dang, I sell to Table 52 and didn't think about it anymore. And then the chef was nice enough to call me the next day. I want to tell you they loved your bacon. That was where the Obamas ate right before they got on the plane to go to the inauguration. That's correct. What about that? Well, as they say where I'm from, who would have thunk? <laughs> <laughs> welcome, um, to the, welcome to the broadcast. When did you start curing meat and when did this whole thing start for you? Well, my family um, lived a very rural lifestyle. Uh, both sets of grandparents. I was born in Scott County, Virginia, just across the Tennessee line. Both sets of grandparents lived there in those mountains, uh, just a mile apart. And I tell people it's not by accident that my people, my mom and dad, got married because you had to court somebody within walking distance. <laughs> <laughs> Neither side of the family owned a car, truck, or tractor. They farmed with horses and mules. They raised everything they ate. And we would always go there, even after we moved to Tennessee, we would go there on Thanksgiving, and we butchered hogs for both sides of the family. Uh, we made sausage, and we put the hams and bacon and sometimes a shoulder or two and cure. That was the only way they had of preserving this stuff, and uh, they didn't have freezers, so they would can what was left of that pig that they couldn't preserve in some other way. And with that background, uh, never thought about going into the meat business. I actually um, finished the University of Tennessee with a BS in education and taught school for three or four years before really? I got into the meat business. So uh, what changed? You well, taught school for three years and said, I can make more bacon making <laughs> bacon. <laughs> well, I had just, I taught school the first year in Brevard County, Florida, and I came home on spring break and I ran into the superintendent of schools uh, on the street and he inquired what I was doing and I told him that I was uh, teaching school in Brevard County, Florida. And he said, well, he said, come see him in the morning. He had a job for me. And I said, oh no, I make more money down there. I, I can't do that. And he said, but you need to get a graduate degree. The university's just up the road and you needed a graduate degree. Come see me in the morning. Well, I thought about it that night and reflected on what he said and I went to see him and he gave me a job, he offered me a job as a guidance counselor. And I said, well, I'm not certified in guidance. But he said, I know, but we're already discussed it and you're gonna get a graduate degree. You just get certified in guidance along the way and I want you to do this. So I took the job and I went to school in summers and, and got a master's degree at Middle Tennessee State University, not UT. But when I finished, I came back and started the school year and just three or four or five days after school started they came by and brought a copy of the salary schedule <laughs> and i looked at the salary schedule and realized i might have made a poor career choice <laughs> that i wasn't going to be able to survive on what they were paying me and i i actually resigned from my position and my principal said what are you going to do and i said well i don't know i said i'll go across the street and get a job at the gas station i can pump gas and make more than I did because it wasn't self-service in those days and I thought about it and I was really thinking about possibly trying to go to graduate school maybe to law school and I knew that I was going to have to sit out a year to get admitted to law school if, I, if that's what I chose to do and I was trying to think about something to do and I heard this fellow in my community uh, his name was Albert Hicks Albert had had a very successful little country ham business making ham and bacon in his backyard started in 1947 and he ran it till 1973 and he had quit and, and not been doing it for five or six months. I went over and inquired if he would lease me that little building in his backyard and he agreed to 
And I can tell you that I learned many valuable lessons from Albert Hicks. I certainly wouldn't be in the country ham business today were it not for that gentleman. And I could write a list of the lessons that I learned. Uh, What's one of the most valuable lessons that you learned from him? Well, the first day on the job, we didn't even have an adding machine or uh, a calculator. And a customer came in, and I added up some stuff when I sold him some stuff, and Albert was there. And after he left, I wadded up that piece of paper and threw it in the waste can. Albert looked at me, and he said, boy, turn that over and write on the back side before you throw that paper away. <laughs> that was a valuable lesson for a young man. I took to heart what he was telling me. Don't waste. Don't waste. Another thing, if he was out there, and he was often prone to come out to, to hang out with me, he was your stereotypical Southern gentleman, uh, a very astute man. He always wore a hat, and 90% of the time he kept a cigar in his mouth, and 90% of the time it wasn't lit. He just sort of walled it around. And he would come out and hang out there, and if one of his friends came by and was looking for a ham, and in those days we hung them in the rafters, literally, and if, he's, if we were selling on the back left-hand side of the building and one of his friends came by, he would look at me and he'd say, Alan, go back there in that back left-hand corner and get Mr. So-and-so one of those hams. Well, automatically, that gentleman expected he was getting something really special. And in fact, that's where we were selling all along. And it was <laughs> learning how to deal with people and to, and to not only that. Create was, the experience for Create him. the right. experience, but he, Albert always stressed doing business the right way and, and making quality products. And I hope that I'm continuing that tradition and the way that he started it. Wow, I, got, I have so much to ask you. I'm so glad you're here. Alan Benton is my guest of Benton's Bacon. This is Anything is Possible. I'm Hallerett Hilton Hill. More with him in just a moment. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. And now we're getting a lot of attention, I think because of the incredible creativity of the chefs that use my products. All right, uh, this is it. This is uh, Benton's bacon right here. Mr. Benton, I love the ingredients here. It just says, cured with salt, brown sugar, pepper. That's correct. That's it. That's it. Then there's a little log cabin on the packaging. What is that? Well, the recipe that I used for that bacon came straight out of the log smokehouse behind the house I was born in there in Virginia. Uh, I'm probably doing this no better than most good old boys here in Tennessee and all over the South did it. Uh, I'm just doing it that traditional way that we always made bacon. Would you, would you kind of walk me through, because you, you know, I'm thinking about a time before refrigeration. Yes, sir. Um, and meat will decay, so you have to do something to preserve it. Would you take me to school? Would you give me curing 101, bacon 101? <laughs> well, it's so simple. If it were rocket science, I certainly wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> um, this is a, a dry cured product. Normally, we would butcher our hogs on Thanksgiving Day, and we would block them out and trim out the hams, bacon, and shoulders, and get it ready to go into cure in our smokehouses, but we would wait until the day after we kill to do that. We would let the meat get cold overnight. And of course, this was, as you said, the only way they had to preserve that meat. And somewhere along the way, a lot of us got hooked on the flavor of that cured pork. And uh, I think the first people that came here to this country probably brought the, brought the knowledge of how to preserve it with them from Europe. Uh, in Italy, it's prosciutto. In Spain, it can be serrano. And, Black Forest ham out of Germany. They, they dry cured things all over Europe, but, and we proudly call this Tennessee bacon or Virginia bacon. We're probably lying through our teeth. It's an offshoot <laughs> of something that's been done in Europe for, uh, for centuries. And uh, our goal is to make it as good as our European cousins or anybody else in the world is doing it. And I've always felt like good old boys, if you will, here in uh, America, I think we can make automobiles or watches or refrigerators or ham and bacon as good as 
the Japanese or the Europeans or South Americans or anybody else. I think we just have to focus on quality. The way that I make this bacon, we mix a, a mixture of salt, brown sugar, and pepper, and we stir it up good and rub it on the meat, dry cure. We rub the fresh pork bellies, and um, we stack them into curing bins and coolers at 38 to 40 degrees for about a week to 10 days. Then we take them out and wash them and hang them on curing racks and we leave them in another cooler, uh, roughly 40 to 50 degrees, for another week to, to 10 days. And then age them a few more days at room temperature and go into the smokehouse where we finish out the uh, process. We smoke them a very intense smoke flavor. If you don't like smoke, you certainly wouldn't want to buy our smoked bacon because it has a very intense smoke flavor. And after it's been in the smokehouse about three days, we take it out and uh, it's ready at that point when it cools off to slice and package and try to sell and make a profit on it. <laughs> Technology, how is that changing or affecting your business and your process? Well, we're really old school at my, at my business. Um, I am resistant to change. I still use a rotary dial telephone on my desk. <laughs> I did succumb. I do have a computer that I have to use. Um, but everything we do as far as the way we're producing the meat, the only concession to uh, technology is the fact that we do this with refrigeration now. Um, every piece of meat is hand rubbed just like we would have 100 years ago. And a lot of my peers in the business now, everything is automated. But we feel like when quality is so important for us, it's very important to do the traditional cure. And again, we're not nice, we're greedy. We feel like we're making a better product and we feel like that's our niche in the meat business and uh, very thankful that people seem to be liking it. Now, tell me about some of the places that your, your bacon has been, been featured. I, when we started, I read this quote about Table 52, I think it is in yes. Chicago president has eaten it, but you've been featured a number of places. Well, you've heard that old saying, you'd rather be lucky as smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I almost starved to death in this business the first 25 years I was in business. Uh, it was a real struggle to keep the doors open, and I, I'll tell you real quickly, I wouldn't be in business today were it not for the University of Tennessee. Um, the food science department there, I never stepped foot on the agriculture campus until after I graduated. But I, when I got into this business, I wrote to universities all over the, the Southeast because I wanted to learn to do this really well. And the university, uh, I soon figured out, had all the expertise I needed, and they helped me every time I hit a rough spot. They would hold my hand and walk me through it. And now we're getting a lot of attention, I think because of the incredible creativity of the chefs that use my products. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure that my bacon is that incredible. I think that they take what was sustenance food for poor Appalachians all over this area, and they turn it into something spectacular in the incredible ways that they use our products. And we're blessed. Uh, Art Smith, the chef of Table 52, also has a restaurant in D.C. called Art and Soul, and he now has one in Atlanta called uh, Southern Art. And he is one of, without a doubt, one of the top chefs in America. Uh, but we sell to others uh, who are, I hate to hesitate to throw out names, but for fear of leaving out some, but we definitely sell to a lot of the folks on the Food Network. Uh, a lot of those are our customers and uh, have several celebrities that use our products. We don't mention their names out of respect to them. It's not quite kosher to use their name to promote your product, so I never do that but we have several celebrity type per people that order our products and uh, I look up every day and count my blessings. Um, David Chang is one great chef in New York who's well known to use my products. He's probably one of the couple of the hottest chefs in America. He and a, a chef in Charleston, South Carolina by the name of Sean Brock. Um, Sean uh, is the chef at Husk at, and McCready's in Charleston and many, many great chefs that, uh, that use it. Uh, Frank Stitt at Highland Bar and Grill in, in Birmingham is definitely one of the top chefs in America. Uh, John Besh in New Orleans and Emeril Lagasse. Uh, These are all the biggest names. Well, they're, the they're great chefs and 
I feel so blessed that they like my products. Let's take a break here. Alan Benton is my guest. This is Benton's Bacon. You're watching Anything is Possible. Coming up. And he said, well, son, he said, first off, if you play the other guy's game, you always lose. And he said, secondly, if you will stick with quality, he said, sooner or later, quality will sustain you in this business. You're watching Anything is Possible. This is Halloran Hilton Hill, and my guest is Alan Benton of Benton's Smoky Mountain Country Hams. Is that the official title of the company? Well, I guess so. Most right. people just call us Benton's now. Benton's, all right. Thank you for being with us. I, I love your way. You have a very gentle, you're a Southern gentleman. Well, thank you. That's a very fine compliment. <laughs> Not, I'm um, sure you know me well enough to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll take <laughs> but it. But I'll today. sure take the compliment. Yes, sir. What What have you learned about just being a quality person when it comes? Because you're getting notoriety around the world. You 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 know ran off a litany of the finest chefs in the world that are using your bacon that are telling other people this is as good as it gets. I mean that's what. I mean this is really an expression of, like you said, sustenance food and processes that were developed by people who had no idea that their food would be served in the finest restaurants around the world. Um, but there has to be something that you've learned about the quality imperative, not only in the bacon, but in the person. Well, when I first went in business, my father, who has been dead since 1995, he died before I had any degree of success in the business, and I give anything if he had lived to see it because he told me first off always do business with good people whether you're buying from them or selling to them that's incredibly sound advice if you're in business because it always works and I'd been in business for four or five years and I was struggling and I was trying to age my hams for 12 to 18 months and I was trying to sell them for the same price that people were selling them for who were curing them in 80 days. And I was just losing money every way I turned and I told my father one day that I thought I was going to have to start selling a speeded up cure. I was going to have to cure them in 80 or 100 days in order to survive. Well he got quiet and he looked at me and he said, well son, he said first off if you play the other guy's game, you always lose. And he said, secondly, if you will stick with quality, he said, sooner or later, quality will sustain you in this business. And I stuck with quality. It took a long time to turn the corner, and it was actually a local customer that opened up the world for me. Uh, How'd that happen? Blackberry Farm uh, here in Wallen, Tennessee is a five-star resort. It's one of the finest institutes in the country, without a doubt. Uh, Chef John Fleer, uh, who came there, um, he had been Mary, Mary Tyler Moore's chef right out of culinary school. He was originally from North Carolina. He came there in the early 90s, and he single-handedly started sharing my products with uh, customers across the country. They have some of the best chefs in America that visit there, and they also have some of the best chefs in America that work there. Uh, chef Joseph Lynn and uh, Josh Feathers are both incredibly talented chefs along with a host of other folks that they have. And for a long time, um, I was better known in Manhattan than I was in my home state of Tennessee. Wow. I didn't realize there was really a market here in Tennessee for our products and uh, eventually I started picking up that there was and uh, I started shipping some stuff to restaurants in Nashville and calling on a few places here in Knoxville and, and now I couldn't be more blessed or thankful that my home state sort of adopted me and I have a lot of customers in state now that use our products, a lot of customers in Memphis and Nashville, Chattanooga and Knoxville and trust me I count my blessings every day. <laughs> Talk to me about the quality of, of the hogs. We, I tell people all the time, we buy, we try to buy the best fresh pork we can get to start with because it's very important what kind of animal you use. We try to buy as much pasture raised pork as we can source. Primarily old breeds of pigs like Berkshire, Tamworth, Red Wattle, they have more intramuscular fat and marble and uh, if you start out with something good it's so much easier to make something good. And mm -hmm. 
they're usually antibiotic free when they're pasture raised, which I really like. We don't advertise our products as being antibiotic free or, or any of that stuff, organic. Uh, but I tell people we do that not because we're nice, but because we're greedy. <laughs> we, want to, we want to sort of get a, a one up on the competition, so to speak. And when I started doing this about 10 years ago, not many, uh, not many of my peers were, were sourcing that pork and it was much easier. Today, not only are other producers that do what I do sourcing that pork, but also great chefs all over the country are sourcing it. They're too going after that better pork. So it makes it a challenge. I spend a good bit of time trying to find that pork today. Tell me about your family. I have an, an incredibly nice family. I hate to brag on them, but I have a, an incredible wife, my wife Sharon. I couldn't have found a better mate anywhere in the world. And we have three children. Uh, my oldest is a psychiatrist. She's in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, my middle daughter, is uh, Elizabeth, is a, a nurse practitioner in Blount County, and my son, Darrell, is doing his residency here in Knoxville in radiology. Wow. Uh, they want to cure anything but ham and bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some advice for the rogue. Halloran, you're trying to be successful in life. Here's what I've learned. Give me some advice for the rogue. Well, I quote a friend of mine quite often. Every day, you have to try to do the right thing. Because even trying to do the right thing, you're going to do wrong enough. And uh, I think it's very important to always try to treat people in as kind and respectful a way as you possibly can. And it's also important to try to make the best product you know how to make. I think that's important. I think my customers deserve the best that I know how to produce. And I have a crew of folks at my place while I'm here talking to you having a good time who are helping to churn out some good bacon and ham today. It's not a one-man show. I owe my employees a real debt for being there. You're a class guy. I'm well, glad I got a chance to meet you. Well, uh, I'm delighted to be here. No wonder your bacon tastes so good. Well, <laughs> we hope the proof's in the pudding. <laughs> Thank you for coming by. What a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Alan Benton on Anything is Possible. We'll see you next week.